Welcome to Life Today Live. I'm Randy Robinson, and uh, this is going to be a discussion that's really going to help some of you. Now, I don't know where you're at. Maybe, uh, maybe you're young and you don't think about finances. Um, maybe you're established and you're not worried about finances. Well, wherever you're at, uh, this is going to be good information for you. But if you're in the middle of a job loss, of uh, a tanking economy, hello world, um, this is going to be very beneficial for you. So hang around, stick around, and uh, you're going to pick up some things that are going to help you. You might have heard of Larry Burkett, helped tons of people financially, started Crown Financial Ministries. That is now run by a gentleman named Chuck Bentley, and he's with us right now. Chuck, how are you doing out there? I'm doing great, Randy. Good to see you today. Uh, I appreciate you coming on because, you know, 2020 has been a nightmare year for a lot of people and not just the, uh, the whole scare we had and now not knowing what's going to happen in the fall from a health standpoint, which can be unnerving enough, but from a financial standpoint, man, what in the world is going on? Well, Randy, we have two problems at the same time. The first one is people are afraid of losing their life to the coronavirus. And I've actually had some people who have lost their life or, or friends who have uh, had family members lose their life. And it's just been terrible. So there's a legitimate concern and fear that caused the government to take really draconian action and shut down uh, the economy practically all over the world. The major segments of the economy have been interrelated for a long time so when one country shuts down it affects all of them we've all shut down at the same time and that's created our second crisis which is an economic crisis and i like to say we've got a problem with saving lives and we've got another bigger problem i think with saving livelihoods because so many people are unable to work some are not in that situation where they can work remotely and they can carry on their their business from home uh, you and I are doing that right now. I mean, uh, this is what I do a lot of. We do radio and media, podcasting and uh, live broadcasting like this. So uh, we get to continue from our homes. Uh, but a lot of people that go out to work haven't been able to do it. So they're hurting financially. And this is a really serious challenge for our nation and one that I think uh, we really need God's help and intervention to get back on our feet. Yeah, you know, when, when the, they announced the lockdown, the whole goal initially <laughs> was to flatten the curve. And by that, they meant just not overwhelm the healthcare system. So we did that. And I celebrate the fact that we were able to, to flatten that, that uh, medical curve. Uh, and so, you know, we didn't end up having a lot of the issues that we, we could have had. But at the same time, you saw that unemployment curve start to soar and it's a little bit of chaos trying to flatten that curve uh, how long do you do you have what, I, I'm not gonna hold you to predictions because I realize nobody knows but how long do you think it's gonna take to get the economy back to a strong position again well the government is taking uh, unprecedented measures as you know Randy to try to make that happen I think unprecedented is going to be the, the word of the year because we're using it yeah. for practically every description of everything. But you know, the unemployment curve is actually vertical. Uh, we've never seen it go vertical like this in its history. It's It has gone straight up, unprecedented amount of uh, people losing their jobs. Uh, our hope and what many people think may happen is that it could invert and become an inverted V as the economy begins to open slowly and it phases back into to uh, full uh, scale where we used to be. Uh, a good story for me is I, I had a dentist appointment scheduled in the midst of this and we were in phase one of our reopen which meant uh, a few more essential services could begin uh, doing what they needed to do. So our dentist opened back up for business and he said his business is booming. Hmm. They are at full tilt with just the backlog, uh, people needing to come in. And I'm hoping that's the case for many other businesses, that they're able to, to reopen and rehire. That's the most important thing is to get people reemployed again. Yeah. Uh, what about the investment side of things? Um, I know, I mean, we, we, 
we don't know from day to day what the stock market's going to do, where it's going to be. Um, are, are you seeing, I don't know, what, what are you seeing out there in, in regards to, I don't know, 401ks and things like that? Well, most people are describing this as disconnect, uh, where the market is actually doing extremely well. The publicly traded stocks and, mm -hmm. and people who are invested are, are actually uh, quite active and optimistic. But the disconnect is that seems to be disassociated with reality in the economy. And by the economy, I mean uh, the businesses that contribute to the growth of this country, our GDP, people who employ others, all of those sort of real mechanisms are hurting. And yet the market is soaring, uh, it's growing, and people are optimistic. And the reason, I think, is twofold. First of all, they are anticipating uh, good news soon. They're anticipating that uh, this is going to be over sooner than expected. It's going to be less uh, impact to uh, the healthcare system than expected. And that companies will be back at full tilt sooner than uh, many uh, people are anticipating. And so they're trying to buy low so that they can uh, take advantage of the uptick in the market. So there's been an extreme amount of uh, volume of people who are trading. I think that these measures that the government are taking, which will be in, in, in effect uh, throughout this summer, I think they're going to work, uh, Randy. I'm quite yeah. optimistic that our economy is going to recover and, and uh, that the market disconnect is going to be somewhat reflective of reality and that they had a reason for optimism. And I, I'm encouraging people to be active investors right now. Hmm. Interesting. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know how specific you want to get. I actually bought uh, a couple different cruise line stocks uh, right after they tanked. So I'm optimistic on that front. Does that strike you as a good idea? <laughs> Well, I, I track these kind of things, Randy. It's fun to talk about them. Yeah. I'm not giving investment advice, by the way, but uh, you know, the, they're up 300% over uh, where they were just a few months ago in terms of their bookings. And some of those bookings are at a higher rate than they were 12 months ago. Wow. So people are wanting to go on a cruise again. And uh, so I think that was a good investment. I bought gasoline-related stock, <laughs> stock prices. Uh, went to when the price of oil went to almost nothing. I knew it had to come back, uh, and that's been a good investment. So, when the market goes down, uh, essentially, they're, hold, uh, they're holding a sale. They're asking, they're putting their stocks on sale, and it's frightening to buy them on sale. But it's the best time to do it. So it creates a good opportunity for investors like you. Yeah. Well, well, that is offset. I assure you, because I also bought some. Uh, gas and oil related and uh, they declared bankruptcy. So. <laughs> well, that's why we're not giving financial advice, Randy. Yeah, no, you don't, you don't want it from me, trust me. Let's get back to more of the average person. Um, <laughs> and you know, what, what, what should they do? Should they be hoarding every penny through the summer? Or uh, you know, what, what, I think a lot of people, I know. I will say this. I saw a report that said that uh, donations, 20% uh, of people quit donating to charities, and it was like 63, I think, percent had uh, said that they were going to be more cautious. Uh, is, is caution the word for the summer financially? Well, I think so. When this started to unfold, I pulled my children together. I have four boys, five grandchildren, and I pulled my staff together and I said, I want to give you some personal financial advice. And it reflected what the, the decisions that my wife and I made. And I, I'll share those uh, with your audience here, Randy, because I think they're still very, very helpful. First of all, as I recommended to cut back your spending by 25% throughout the summer. And the reason I did is because that's the estimate that people like Goldman Sachs are giving for the economic retraction, for the decline. So if the economy is going to decline 25, 30 percent, our spending needs to decline so that we can get ahead of it, so that we're not uh, caught in a trap if the economy continues to worsen. Most people have had to cut back on their spending anyway. They're not, they haven't been able to go out to eat. They haven't been able to go shopping. Right. They're not traveling, all those other things. The, the budget has been trimmed. So I'm recommending carry that on for at least another 90 days throughout the summer so that people can uh, increase their savings. 
Forty percent of Americans went into this crisis without a thousand dollars in emergency savings, and that makes them very, very vulnerable. And so we're recommending not only you should cut back on your spending, but step two is to increase your saving. Now, I was doing a little study on what people did with their stimulus money, and about 60 percent of them went out and spent it. Uh, they bought uh, consumer goods with it, which is not a very good investment. Forty hmm. percent uh, have saved it. They've sat on it. They've, they've waited to do something with it. And I think if you're in the group of people who don't have $1,000 in savings, you definitely need $1,000 in savings. In fact, in a time like this, you need about three months of your expenses set aside. So cut back on your expenses and increase your savings. Those are the two basic moves that people need to be doing right now. And then I think third is to give sacrificially. Uh, you know, church is set apart by our giving. We are the, the body of believers. We, we distinguish ourselves with money by being uh, generous, by making giving our priority. That's what the Lord told us to do. And so I've been recommending to people that uh, we make giving our top financial priority through the crisis. If this were a fire or a flood or a tsunami or a hurricane or uh, you name it, we would be responding generously. Uh, so because we can't see a lot of the damage, because it's not flashed on the evening news, uh, you know, destruction everywhere, uh, it's, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. But we've got neighbors that are hurting. We've got friends that are hurting. We've got people we go to church with that are hurting. Uh, and they need our help. And ministries need our help. And ministries like yours that are getting the word out and helping equip the body of Christ in times like this need our help. And so the body of Christ needs to be extraordinarily generous during this time. Yeah, you know, our my, my church that I attend, um, we do a food pantry. And man, I saw some of the photos from, we did it all the way through the pandemic. Some of the photos, man, those lines got longer and longer and longer. And, and so I, I would, my personal addendum to that would be to, to give to someone who is a Christian organization who's helping the community. Um, I, I think that <laughs> the one thing we can say is that the pandemic offered the church the chance to really be the church. And so the, the ones that yeah. are doing that, where they're, they're helping people with their practical needs, I, in a way, um, that's kind of like the stock market and where, where you want to buy low and sell high. Because if you're investing in a church that's helping people's needs, you're, you are investing into that community in a way that will pay off later. So I, I appreciate you pointing out that we should still be giving. I think we should be wise in the giving. Yeah, thank you so much, Randy. I agree with that. You know, uh, the reason I always say that we have to save more money is because that eliminates our fear of giving. The, the primary reason people don't give more is fear. They're fearful of what tomorrow may bring. But the Lord calls us to trust him with whatever tomorrow may bring. And in fact, he is faithful to those who are willing to trust him in a time like this. And you look at the book of Acts when the apostles gathered together in, uh, uh, where did they, in Antioch. They were in Antioch. And uh, Agabus came and said, there's a great famine that's going to spread throughout the entire Roman world. Well, that wasn't very good news, and that's frightening. That means people are going to be hungry. They're, they're potentially going to starve to death. And so the apostles got together and said, well, our plan is to send help. Our plan is to give. Mm -hmm. They didn't make a plan to hoard. Mm -hmm. And I think what sets the church apart is when times are tough, we share, we give. We, we do things different than the world, and that – is what's necessary and the Lord says that's the highest return on your investment of anything you can invest in it can't be stolen or lost or destroyed and you know we laughed about our investments uh, Randy we shared the good ones but <laughs> we made a lot of bad ones and we've lost money but you can't lose money giving to God's kingdom mm -hmm. it's literally impossible not do it yeah that is so true all right shift gears just a touch uh, I have a question and this <laughs> directly impacts my household. My son and daughter-in-law um, have, have moved in with us uh, after their apartment lease uh, was up because they wanted to save up a little bit of money. We had tons of room because all my kids are moving out now. And so we're like, just come st just stay with us uh, for just a, just a short time. Well, 
then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so that short time got longer and longer. And you know, it's been great. Uh, we love having them there. But now they're like, okay, what, what do we do? Which way is the housing market gonna go? Because I know here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, housing is ridiculously expensive because everybody's moving to Texas. Um, but do you have any kind of idea uh, you know, is this a good time to buy or should people wait a little longer? Uh, do you have any sense of the housing market? Yeah, I do. I keep up with things like that, Randy. I like that question. Uh, we've uh, got one still left at home. He's uh, 19, our youngest is 19, and uh, then he'll be uh, getting through college here in the next couple of years and looking for a place to live. But relative to the housing market, uh, new housing starts are slower than they've been in the last 10 years. And when new housing starts are slow, that means the value of existing inventory increases. So uh, if you have a house for sale, the price is going to remain good. Hmm. People think it's probably going to come down, but it's actually going to go up. And so there's a, a strange dynamic happening because new housing is, is slow but existing housing is, uh, will be more scarce. So it's a good time to sell a house, but it's also a good time to buy because we have a historic low mortgage rate. And uh, so if you wanna get into a house now, you're probably gonna get the all time record low mortgage. And so I recommend that uh, go ahead and buy. I wouldn't wait to see if prices are gonna fall. Uh, real estate will come back, it, it may dip. If we go into even a severe depression, uh, experts are thinking if that happens, it's probably 18 to 24 months, and then we're back out of it, and then your real estate will continue to grow and appreciate, and especially if you're in Texas, you know, everything's booming in Texas right yeah. now. You have some of the top destinations in the United States where people want to move. Yeah, yeah, we do. What about uh, refinancing an existing mortgage? Good time to do that, I would think, with the low interest rates. Yeah, it, that, that's exactly right. It's a good time to refinance. You know, there's a couple of rules of thumb about buying a house and refinancing, and that is you need some equity. Uh, I don't recommend that people buy a home or refinance a home if they still have private mortgage insurance, if they have to have pay PMI, right. because that's money that you're just wasting. I try to save up enough money, hopefully for a 20% or more down payment, and if you refinance, you need to be able to stay in that home at least seven years to afford the payback or the savings in your refinance cost. So don't refinance if you're about to move in the next three to five years. Hmm. Okay. All right. Another question. And uh, since this is this is a, a Christian program, so I don't use profanity, but it comes. It's a little difficult to to, to tame my tongue when I want to talk about this next topic, and and that's credit cards. Um, What's your take on credit cards? Cut them all up or use them wisely? or Because, you know, those guys are they're, they're robber barons when it comes to interest. Well, I wanted to see uh, what was causing you to want to use foul language <laughs> before I answered this. <laughs> it's the interest rates. Um, okay. Yeah, the interest rates are terrible. It's the worst form of credit that you can use. Uh, it's... You know, give you an example, Randy, if you have $5,000 balance on your credit card and you're paying the average interest rate somewhere between 14 and 18 percent on a credit card and you go out for an evening of dinner and you buy a pizza and a few drinks, you have a nice little time out. You will pay for that pizza for about 21 years. <laughs> and uh, people don't realize they're taking out a mortgage to buy a pizza yeah. or to have it delivered to their house. And so we recommend when it comes to credit cards, it's best, you know, most people need one in today's society for renting a car or mm -hmm. travel or online purchases. But we recommend you only have one and that you pay it off at the end of every month and you get some sort of reward for that. You get, you know, airline miles or you get some sort of payback, cash back and that you never allow the balance to be carried over from month to month, and you never miss a payment, you never get behind, because if you do, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's a quagmire. Uh, my wife and I have had credit, a credit card, the same one, for probably 25 years. We've never paid on a balance. Uh, we have never paid a late payment. And so it's really not cost us anything 
but we've earned hundreds and hundreds of thousands of airline miles mm. as a result of just using it wisely. So I, I don't like credit cards um, if, you're, if you lack self-control. But if you have self-control, a credit card can be a nice little financial tool. Yeah, it can, and and I'm I'm par partially joking. Um, I, I I tell you the the difficulty I've had is because I do the same thing. I get the airline miles. I'm I'm flying for free this summer um, because of that. But then something happens. Like a couple of years ago, I had, I had I was in an accident, and it, all of a sudden, you know, I'm out tens of thousands of dollars. Um, what do you? What should you do? I know what I did. I put it on a credit card and still paying it off. Um, what should somebody do when they don't have tens of thousands of dollars in the bank and something happens completely out of your control and now you got you got to pony up? Yeah. Well, there's, there's low-cost debt and there's high-cost debt. I consider a credit card a high-cost debt. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the debt you want to avoid. If you've got any type of savings plan, any type of retirement plan, borrowing from that in a crisis would be a lower cost of debt. Uh, there are some uh, rules that allow you to withdraw funds from a from a 401k or an IRA in the event of emergency and avoid some penalties. You have to pay it back, but usually that's a lower cost. Mm. And then if that is not available to you, then using your home equity in the form of a home equity line of credit, a HELOC, is a lower cost of uh, debt as well. I don't like to use either one of those methods, but they're alternatives to the credit card method. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in in, a, in event of emergency, I would go to one of those two first. Yeah, good advice. Uh, all right, well, um, that's I, 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 that's the end of my financial kind of rope. So help me out here. What, what else do people need to know during, during a tough time and, or maybe just in general uh, the, the advice that people need to hear? Well, I think what's happening uh, with the unemployment trend right now, with almost 30 million Americans out of work, approaching nearly 20% of our workforce, we really need to be helping them to get reemployed. Mm -hmm. And I wrote an article recently called The Upside of Unemployment. And this applies to those who are unemployed right now or you're trying to help a child or a grandchild get into the workforce. Because right now, it could be extremely tough. It could be harder than it's ever been. My 19-year-old is looking for a summer job, and it is not easy. Mm. Yeah, I bet. Uh, there's just uh, not enough jobs right now for the amount of people who are looking for work. So I laid out a couple of things, Randy, I'll share with folks that I think can be helpful. Uh, number one, if you did experience a layoff, uh, the upside of that is right now the benefits are pretty extraordinary. Uh, they're the best they've ever been. You can draw unemployment on the federal and state level for 10 and a half months. That's almost a full year. Plus, you get $600 a week uh, for up to, uh, in some cases, two or three weeks, and they're looking at extending that amount maybe all the way through December. So if you're getting an extra $2,400 a month on top of your federal and state unemployment benefits, uh, you've got a cushion. You've got an opportunity to relax to think, to pray, to really do your, your homework and find out where God wants you to go. And so take the maximum benefits, that's what they're there for. Secondly, use this as a time to discover something deeply about yourself. Uh, we counsel people looking for jobs all the time, we've been doing that for years, uh, but 50% of the people in the workforce are unhappy. They're frustrated, they're miserable, they're not doing what they were designed by God to do. And so we recommend you discover your God-given design. I'll give you an example, Randy. I, I say your God-given design are things like what you do in your free time when nobody is asking you to do it. You just sort of migrate there. What do you do that gives you the most joy? What do you do that nobody has to ask you to do or motivate you to do? Uh, and we had, a, we had a child that uh, would sit at the piano from three years old and compose music. <laughs> And uh, yet he was a very gifted student, and so we had him tested, and he tested very high in engineering, and he got a full academic scholarship to college to study engineering. 100% wow. full ride, and he, he made straight A's, and his junior year he called me, 
And he said, Dad, I don't want to be an engineer. <laughs> and I asked him the dumbest question I should have already known. I said, what do you want to do? You know what he told me? Music. He, he wants to do music. Mm -hmm. He wanted to write music. And I, I just thought, I should have seen that. He did not like engineering. And he dropped that was Randy and pursued his dream and he followed made him to who God made him to be and uh, yesterday we got notice just yesterday that he's listed in the top 10 uh, Christ, writers of Christian music in the world today really? uh, he's written more than a hundred uh, Christian songs many of them that you would know or sing or or enjoy uh, and God has used him in a very powerful way God's provided for him and uh, he does engineering as a hobby now and music as a career. And I would have recommended that he do it the, the inverse other way. of that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Especially uh, in a pandemic. There's probably a lot more engineering jobs than uh, musician jobs in, the, in, a, in a crisis situation. But no, no, that's great. Uh, th that raises another question that I, I do have, and that is the value of college. Uh, I have four children. Um, one of them just graduated from A&M. Another one's got another year. Another one graduated a few years ago. One of them dropped out of college and went into a trade, and is far happier and is very successful. What, what's your what's your take on sort of the higher education system and when it comes to investing in lives? Well, I think that I think these children are borrowing money that they shouldn't be borrowing. They're going into far more debt than they should be. They're getting degrees that don't lead to jobs. And I think that there's going to be a huge bubble that burst where kids no longer continue to do that. Uh, colleges are going to be one of the casualties, I think, of this pandemic where some of them will not survive because kids are going to learn they can get it done much cheaper online and they can study things that they're more designed to do and avoid the student loan debt. Studies have shown if somebody goes to trade school, avoids student loan debt and gets into the workforce sooner than the person who graduates from college with student loans, Long term, they're usually better off financially. Hmm. Uh, there's benefits to a good education, but there's also uh, limitations to that. And we're considering in our children's life. In fact, out of my four boys, Randy, one graduated from college, full honors. The other one went for a full ride and dropped out of college. And the other two aren't really interested right hmm. now. So we're, we're looking at how did God design them? What are they motivated to do that they can uniquely contribute to the world to bring someone value with their gifts and talents and to be uh, and to enjoy what they do? This is the opportunity of the pandemic. If you're laid off, consider what God made you to do and pursue that. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know I would end up in ministry one day, Randy, and maybe you didn't either. Uh, I tried to run. I, <laughs> right. Well, I, I worked in business. I did a lot of other things. And then one day I realized that God was actually calling me to this type of work and that he had equipped me for it, and I was ready to serve him in it. Uh, but it took uh, a few challenges and a few mistakes along the way to discover that. Mm -hmm. And so people who are laid off, I see this as an opportunity. Uh, go where God wants you to go. There's a lot of companies hiring. There's going to be a lot of new industries developed. There's going to be a lot of uh, opportunity for you to really be the – the round peg fitting in a round hole, if you would just pursue the Lord and ask Him what He wants to do with you. Good words, uh, good advice, just beyond the financial. Chuck Bentley from the Crown Financial Ministries. And uh, Chuck, I'm going to ask you if there's anything on the website people need to know as I show them the website. This is crown.org. Um, what, what, what's available for people here? Well, we've got lots of things available. First of all, we've got online courses that I think are better than Netflix to use your time. You can learn how to manage money God's way. You can learn about getting out of debt. You can learn how to build a budget. We've even got courses on there called uh, How to Build a Crisis Budget. If you're in crisis right now, extremely helpful. Those are free. We also have a course called Money Dates. It's for spouses to go on dates uh, and discuss their finances over a period of 10 different uh, outings and it's a lesson that shows you what to talk about when you go on that date, what to do after you've discussed those topics. And it's helped lots of couples get on the same page. We also have uh, jobs that are opening up for people who are job searching. We have assessment tools to understand how God designed you 
where you, you can get back in the workforce and do something that God wants you to do, not just to make a living. Uh, we have classes there for people who are uh, wanting to teach their children how to manage money. Uh, and that's going to be a big issue during the, the economic recovery because so many kids thought money was growing on trees and now they realize uh, that tree uh, isn't growing anymore mm. and they're going to have to get uh, financially savvy themselves. Great information, uh, great advice, and uh, appreciate, man, I just appreciate all that you do. Appreciate your time sharing with the audience and I encourage people to check out crown.org. Uh, and uh, we can recover. I think that's one thing, I, I, Chuck, you and I both agree on is that uh, when, when God is our banker, our financial manager, uh, it doesn't mean we won't go through difficult times, we won't go through lean times, we won't learn how to live, walk by faith and not by sight, but uh, we, always, we always have hope because we have uh, the man who owns everything, the one who owns, I shouldn't say man, the one who owns everything in charge. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate you, Randy. Thanks for allowing me to be your guest today. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful information. Hope this has helped you guys out there. And by the way, share this because, you know, it, people need to, they, they need some solid wisdom. So share the website, crown.org, and share this interview wherever you're at, slash Life Today TV, uh, Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, all those wonderful places. Be sure to come back soon because we are here every weekday on Life Today Live. Oh. Thank God.